of these soldiers captured what can be described as some of the war's most dramatic and vivid battle video. Earlier I spoke with Craig about this battle and the gripping frontline images. pulled up, uh, we took mainly light arms fire from a trench system and underneath bridge embutments. Uh, we dismounted soldiers there and they went in after it right away. Um, thank goodness that they did because that's what really saved the butts of the forces. And it looked look to us here, the enemy um, is below that overpass? Yeah, but there was a series of uh, bridge abutments that went back some distance and then trenches behind it, as well as you can see there were berms under the overpasses, uh, not the overpasses, but the on-ramps and the off-ramps. And we're looking and, at uh, what, we're looking at what it was a large area of fire. Yes, uh, they took quite a few wounded there. Um, I believe one special forces as well. There's also a shot, I think, there of a gentleman uh, wounded coming out on a stretcher and firing as he's still on a stretcher. And I, I think we're not there yet. I know the shot you're talking about. It's a remarkable uh, scene. What we're seeing now is, uh, I don't know if these are medics or soldiers, running across now uh, to where it looks like at least a couple of guys are down. Yes, uh, those were first casualties there. Uh, I believe one of the first ones was a, uh, a severe leg injury, and they had to try to get that person out as fast as possible. Obviously under fire. Um, we're hearing a lot of a lot of gunfire from both sides. Was this small arms fire that's being aimed at you guys? Well, it was small arms fire. There was uh, larger automatic weapons fire. Uh, a lot of RPGs started coming in. Um, it was pretty obvious that they had uh, they had range on us near the end for sure. But uh, we we took it from a lot of different places. Um, it was interesting because the groups that we were with was not a normal fighting unit. They were put together from another group of uh, units. Uh, they expect the lightest contact where we were, and it turned out to probably be the heaviest. Now we're seeing what looks like someone on a Bradley uh, essentially charging. Are you At this point, do they decide to rush the enemy forces, or do they have them on the run here? Well, it's fairly early on. We're doing pretty well right there. The uh, American uh, forces very much had charge of what was going on. As you can see, I, I believe they're going up toward uh, the underpasses and trying to clear that area. Um, from the other side, when that was happening, we started taking RPG fire from some distance. Uh, there was a, a complex of uh, warehouse buildings that looked like behind, and uh, mortar fire was returned from the U.S. forces and very much leveled that building that stopped that. That was, that was an entirely different quadrant from where we were. This went on for, I guess, about five hours or so, and uh, U.S. forces started to run low on ammo, low on fuel, and they made a decision to put together a convoy to resupply. That convoy had to run a gauntlet of RPG fire. Unfortunately, in that, con in that uh, gauntlet, Two U.S. soldiers were killed by our RPG fire. And we're seeing a soldier here just tossing a grenade. Made it through. Yes. Um, that was to clear some of the berm areas uh, behind the bridge abutments. I believe the grenades were thrown for. Uh, dismounted uh, soldiers went in and, and did a very good job of doing that. Remember. For many of these soldiers, that was the first time in combat. And Craig, I want to, this is the picture you were talking about. Let's watch the man on the stretcher. Watch what he does. I got to ask you, Craig, did he hit what he was aiming at? Yes. Twice, I think. We have to take a short break, but when we return, the rest of my interview with photographer headlines conclude USMSNBC.com. Well, before the commercial break, we were showing you some of the gripping images from a battle the 3rd Infantry Division engaged in on Monday. That was before the fall of Baghdad. NBC photographer Craig White was with the unit and captured the fierce firefight as it unfolded before his eyes. They were ambushed. Earlier, I spoke with Craig White about being in the middle of that firefight as U.S. soldiers fought to gain control of Route 8 in Baghdad. Here's more of the pictures narrated by Craig White.
I got to ask you, Craig, did it hit what he was aiming at? Yes. Twice, I think. This played we five or six hours, and the, 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 I've seen so many moments just looking at this tape of, of heroism here and, and bravery. That's one, and we're going to see some more here in a moment as another, I believe, wounded soldier uh, in just a moment here is, is being treated. Did you know where the fire was coming from at any given time, or, or, or did you find yourself simply uh, lost to know? I found myself. I found myself turning around because you'd think fire was coming from one direction and uh, it would shift. It would shift from one quadrant to another quadrant. Um, the threats kept changing. It was very well laid out and it revealed itself somewhat slowly. We thought we were taking fire mainly from one direction originally and then it started letting up from other areas. Um, what's interesting about the videotape is you don't hear nine tenths of the small arms fire. It was coming in. It just does not, doesn't pick it up. Here's this other shot that I, you I don't find amazing. appreciate. This is this is the man with the wounded leg who's going to go ahead and take position, even as the medic is treating him. That is Bob Gallagher. I think that's his third Purple Heart. His last one was in Mogadishu in the now famous incident. And it looks like he took some prisoners as well. Yes, uh, quite a few prisoners were taken. They were interrogated, uh, we had an interpreter on site, and we found out that uh, many of these people were Syrian Mujahideen, RPG teams trained in Syria and volunteering to, to come here and, and make holy war. They weren't even Iraqis, although we know that there were Iraqis involved as well. Um, there was Iraqi artillery, we believe. Um, near the end, there were some loud expo explosions and uh, the supplies that they brought in were hit. A fuel truck went ablaze right next to it. Uh, ammo truck, and there were other ammo trucks and fuel trucks. They saved most of them. And I believe there's a shot somewhere. In fact, it's, of, it's, it's right here. It's burning. And I think what we want to pause is people will actually hear the ammunition cooking off as, as one soldier, I guess, tries to move the other ammo truck out of the way. That's correct. I believe it was Sergeant Joe Todd. And at, at the distance, I think you heard his driver say, no, Joe, don't. And he told me afterwards it's because he had no children and he knew that Joe had children. He didn't want him going into it. We knew we had to get out of there in a hurry right about then because uh, the ammo truck blew. It was way too close to us. and. Uh, about the same time, luckily, Colonel Twitty, who was monitoring the radio, uh, sent in a uh, platoon of Bradleys, and they came just about the right time. I know by the time they came, the chaplain had a gun and was firing. I thought very seriously about picking up a gun and firing. One of the other soldiers came up to the medics and said, if you can find a gun, I suggest you get one and start firing. Was that a sense of self-preservation, Craig, or was it a sense of, of wanting to protect the soldiers you're with? But no, it was, uh, it was getting close to all hands on deck, so to speak. Um, but uh, timing makes champions, and the cavalry came at the right time. The Pentagon decided to embed journalists like NBC cameraman Craig White with military units because they wanted the press to be witness to war and give the American people a true understanding of what transpires in the battlefield. We certainly saw it. Today, Craig took a few moments to reflect on what he saw during that fierce battle a few days ago. His thoughts in his own words tonight. never feel by looking at pictures what it's like to be in a battle like that. When large artillery go off, large shells, RPGs go off, it makes your teeth rattle. 
Fire came from all sides, 360 degrees. My dad just shot me in the leg. I was with the medical team where the wounded were brought in. One American soldier managed to shoot back while still on a stretcher. And I was with a sergeant nicknamed Black Hawk Bob, Bob Gallagher, two Purple Hearts. He took shrapnel on a leg. It didn't stop him. While he was being treated, he was still firing back. I believe 20 prisoners were taken. What was strange is to see Iraqi prisoners of war being treated medically, the same as American, the same doctors. I took pictures of Sergeant Joe Todd and others actually going into a truck full of ammunition as the vehicle next to it was burning, trying to get it out before it blew up. We didn't win there. We took it, and we moved north. We got out of there. Evidence of what happened on Monday everywhere. Spent shells, bodies, burned out vehicles. Modern warfare is not antiseptic. It smells. You feel it. Do you stop? Pull up your shirt? Drop your pants? Anything in your pockets? The Iraqi citizens returned and tried to pick up the pieces of their lives to go to work or to go home. In another war, it could have been a mountain with a number or a beach with no name. Were it not for these pictures, no one would remember this. I'll never forget it. We honor those who fight this war for their country. We all um, Other American soldiers spoke to me. I had just shot me in the leg. But they got him, so I'm happy. They thought the fight was going well. Uh, later on, it got to be heavier. What was strange is to see Iraqi prisoners of war being treated medically the same as American, the same doctors. I was with a sergeant nicknamed Black Hawk Bob, Bob Gallagher, two Purple Hearts. He took shrapnel on a leg. It didn't stop him. While he was being treated, he was still firing back. I just told China 6 it was okay to do, uh, send R2 up here. People were very heroic. Many of the people I was with were mechanics, not trained infantrymen, not special forces. Of course, they're trained, but they fought back as though they'd fought many times before. For many, this was the first time ever in battle for them, just regular soldiers. We came very close. Very few times in my life have I, and I've been to a few of these, have I ever thought about picking up a gun. This is one. The chaplain picked up a rifle. He was firing back. We never knew how many people really were firing at us. We estimated two to 300. I believe 20 prisoners were taken. Evidence of what happened on Monday everywhere. Spent shells, bodies, burned out vehicles. Modern warfare is not antiseptic. It smells. You feel it. Do you stop? Pull up your shirt? Drop your pants? Anything in your pockets? The Iraqi citizens returned and tried to pick up the pieces of their lives to go to work or to go home. You can never feel by looking at pictures what it's like to be in a battle like that. When in another war, it could have been a mountain with a number or a beach with no name. Were it not for these pictures, no one would remember this. I'll never forget it. Pockets of resistance. Mapping it out tonight, the coalition is that most dangerous of places. There have only been a total of three suicide bombers. That's one a week. I mean, that's an intensity that's kind of less than what the Israelis and the Palestinians have lived with. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.